Sometimes you just need to take the slips out and bowl defensively. And you also need to be careful with your computer's defense as well. If you need a VPN, go Nord. NordVPN.com forward slash Kimber to get a two year contract with a discount plus four extra months and gifts in some markets. It's completely risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. So put in some dot balls and turn them into maidens via NordVPN.com forward slash Kimber. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 47 of the Footmarks podcast. I'm your host, Param Kazi, who you can find at Def Mango on Twitter. And with me, as always, is Jared Kimber, who you can find absolutely everywhere. And the topic of this uh, episode, uh, well, Jared came up with it, is the Sith IPL. So I'm not a Star Wars guy, but I believe that means it's the evil IPL. <laughs> and uh, as you guys might have guessed, we're going to be talking about the predecessor to the IPL, the Indian Cricket League which was basically a rebel league since the BCCI chose not to affiliate itself uh, with it. And Jared, just before we get into things, what are your first thoughts when the acronym ICL is mentioned? Because for me, it's Lahore Badshahs, clear and true. <laughs> yeah, I really watched this tournament. Um, yeah. You know, it was the first one that we saw. Ian Harvey was playing in it. Uh, mm. As you said, Lahore Badshahs. I think, were the Badshahs the second season or the first season? Yes, were- I think they were the second season. Yeah, there was a Bangladesh side as well. Um, you know, so yeah, for me it was a it, it was something that I really remember watching mm. and also, you know, from a I, I was just starting my well, I was a cricket blogger rather than a cricket journalist, but I was just starting that whole thing and I was like, there's something happening here and I don't really understand it. And uh also the ICL was the first thing of you know, because the BCCI and the way Indian cricket had been run and Pakistan mm. and Sri Lankan cricket, it was kind of just run like a slightly different version of English cricket, right? Mm. The national team and, you know, everything was played down and, and very conservative. The ICL was the first time you really went, oh, India is, this is India. And like, it's, mm. you know, uh, it's got its own vibe and this tournament has its own vibe. Yeah, uh, the second thing that comes to my mind after the Lahore Badshahs uh, is Mayanti Langer. That was where she started off, if I'm not wrong. And now she's she's made it big in the industry. But let's roll back the clock a bit, right? We'll come to the ICL, but that wasn't cricket's first Rebel League. Because in the late 1970s, media mogul in Australia, Kerry Packer, gave us World Series Cricket, which was a competition that revolutionized limited overs cricket back in the day. Uh, Packer introduced colored kits and uh, floodlights, the white ball, standardized 50 overs of play, which wasn't a thing back then. And he basically made the format sexy and hip. He was also paying cricketers uh, far more money than what they made elsewhere. And how massive an impact do you think World Series cricket had on our sport at large? And how would you compare that to the ICA? So my memory is that if you played for the West Indies, you got something like, I want to say a couple of hundred dollars hmm. to play a game for the West Indies at that stage. And Kerry Packer was playing pain players, $20,000. Hmm. And these weren't the big name players. These were, you know, further down the chain. I think I've got my numbers right, if I remember that correctly. And so, you know, Kerry Packer essentially wanted to put cricket on Channel 9. There were some issues with it. One was that Channel 9 wasn't accessible in all parts of Australia, whereas the ABC was. And another one was that they didn't want to give it to Kerry Packer because he was loud and w- wanted to change things, and the ABC didn't. If you watch cricket um, in Australia before Kerry Packer, it was like kind of the way that the BBC broadcast it, which was a radio uh, mm. broadcast with visuals, right? So, you know, and they had one camera at one end, and that was Kerry Packer's big thing is, I don't want to spend half my time looking at a batter's ass. Right, that was his big one of his big phrases was talking about that, and which is fair. (laughs) It's very fair. Some of the stuff he did, but the whole thing about Kerry Packer was he wanted cheap content. Hmm. He want there was a limit in at that time in Australia that he had to show so much Australian content, and Kerry Packer worked out very quickly that the two cheapest things were sport at that stage and um, children's TV. Hmm. So he invested a lot of money in sport and children's TV. And uh, and cricket was the one that, that he, he went after. And he was a cricket fan himself, to be fair. And, yeah, and then, as you said, he made it sexy. He made it different. And it wasn't that World Series cricket was a massive success, if mm. we're being honest. 
But it certainly damaged the main product and it completely decimated the Australian team. Like they went yeah. from being a very decent team to being nothing. Uh, prolonged careers. Ian Chappell had retired because he was mm. like, what's the point of me even playing um, anymore if I'm not making any money off this? Um, and he went on to have a really good, uh, you know, World Series cricket uh, career. Uh, so, you know, kept players around. Someone like Ian, uh, uh, Dennis Lilly probably would have retired as well, I think, mm. if it hadn't have been for the extra money that uh, 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 Kerry Packer was bringing in. But it was a TV broadcaster angry that he hadn't got this, and then he went around the world and he hired all the best cricketers because mm. they were, you're going to be shocked to hear this, massively <laughs> underpaid in every <laughs> single market that they were in, and he did not find it very hard to sign up these players. There were some players who didn't want to sign up with it. It wasn't quite like the Saudi Golf League, but there <laughs> were some players who did feel a little bit uncomfortable with it, and there were others who were told by their boards, you do this, you never play for us again. So the West Indians didn't have that. So they were allowed to continue to play. Mm. But obviously, Tony Gregg was Aust – oh, Tony Gregg is a fantastic cricketer. And he was – that was the end of his international career, really. Um, there were other players who had similar kinds of issues. But there were some boards, as we've seen with T20 cricket now, who were a little bit more like, well, we can't pay our players this, so we'll just mm. do whatever we can to keep them around. Uh, and eventually, Kerry Packer got the rights to the cricket. He then stopped paying the players and the players went back to being paid crap money again. So this, uh, and, and that was a rebel league that was, it was huge. It was the biggest story in cricket ever. I don't know if you've ever seen, there's a, doc, a document, there's a mini series called How's That, which, um, which covers it. It's it made by Channel 9. So you can imagine mm. it's quite friendly to Kerry Packer. But of course. It, it is a really, really interesting story. And of course, that, the writing about that series was what got Gideon Haig a career in cricket journalism. Ooh. Um, so his book is definitely worth reading. And it's something I've never covered all that much. But the point being is we had a Rebel League and it, wor and it worked and it shook up cricket. And But that time, the difference was that the person just walked away from it once he got mm. what he wanted. Fair. And I mean, it was created in the first place because after multiple bids, Packer wasn't getting the media yeah. rights to, to get or, he or, or broadcast. He was trying to pay Australian more money. Yeah, yeah, he was trying to pay more money and they were still saying no to him. Yeah, so his response to them saying no was to create a tournament of his own and recruiting the best talent from not just Australia, but around the globe. Now, similar to Packer, you have... Uh, you know, Subhash Chandra, who was the founder of ZTV, of course, an Indian, and he was adamant to get the broadcasting rights for Indian cricket. And, you know, he was ready to dish out big money as well, but the BCCI just did not care for that. They didn't care if he outbid the rest. They didn't want to give them to him. And that is what prompted Subhash Chandra to create the ICL. So while there is that similarity, Jared, of how both of those rebel leagues came into being, the part that is uh, grossly dissimilar uh, between the two is that the ICL was basically hiring, you know, tier two Indian cricketers, washed up international cricketers who had been retired, and a few disgruntled Pakistani cricketers, whereas Kerry Packer had the best in the business play for him. So that is quite a contrast, isn't it? Yeah, well, the West Indies were the best team in the world, and Packer had mm. the entire team, right? Yeah. And as I said, he had the England captain, and you know he had he had the best South African players who obviously couldn't mm. play for South Africa. You know, he had fantastic. Pakistani and New Zealand players as well, right? You know, he, he had everyone. And um, and Subhash Chandra's ICL had uh, Ian Harvey and Lance Klusner and Chris Gale. Incredible Would have been an incredible team in 1998. Um, <laughs> not, so, not so much in 2008 and, yeah. and, and, or 2007 and 2008. So it was very, very different. And... A lot of that came from the fact that at that point, the BCCI did have finances and were willing mm. to spend it. And also because cricket had been through this once before, they were, I, I promise you, you know, I obviously, you know, for a long time, I worked a lot in cricket business and cricket politics. The thing that they've always, they are the most alert about is rebel leagues. Mm. So I don't know if you remember, but, you know, Lalit Modi and Dean Kino, who came up with the Champions League, uh, they they were involved with a potential rebel league a few years ago and even when and spoke to players and the and one of the things that the ICC were doing at the time was they were looking for um domain names mm. that were being registered that suggested that someone was coming up with cricket leagues uh, i think it was i think it was um uh, the ICC but it might have been someone from an individual cricket board mm. that's how they found it and they were terrified of that happening 
And so in 2007 and 2008, when the ICL is coming through, the BCCI very quickly say, if you play in that, your domestic mm -hmm. and international career in normal Indian cricket is over. And on top of that, they also did the other thing that Cricket Australia didn't do back with Kerry Packer, which is they, they then sped their league up to make sure that they were actually going to have mm -hmm. a league that was also going to pay people a lot of money, right? Which Cricket Australia wasn't matching Kerry Packer's wages, mm -hmm. right? They weren't ready to do that. And because of that, they were in a much worse situation. So you... It was very, very different. And the, the other fascinating part of that, of course, is that the ICL League itself essentially was stolen from the BCCI mm -hmm. because it was a Lalit Modi dis, um, choice, uh, sorry, a, a plan that had been kicking around. I, I didn't realize until recently how many people sort of knew about this plan, but they never thought it would work because it was so radical for cricket. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the ICL, it kind of was just the IPL in a slightly different kind of way, not organized as well. And they didn't have IMG and all the good things um, and all the big players, but that's, that's what this league was essentially. It was a franchise league and we'd never had anything like that in cricket before. Um, and it was a T20 league, uh, which was obviously also quite new to Indian cricket because they hadn't had a d Indian domestic, uh, a, a top level Indian domestic T20 league before. Yeah, just on that note, of course, let's talk about Indian cricket at large over here. You know, they experienced a boom after India won the 1983 ODI World Cup. But it wasn't until the home World Cup in 1996, which was hosted by Sri Lanka, Pakistan and India, when uh, the BCCI were truly able to unlock the TV rights gold mine, yeah. right? Uh, you know, since prior to that, uh, Indian cricket was broadcasted by the state-run TV channel called Dur Darshan. They had a monopoly and... Mm -hmm. uh, Basically, the broadcasting riches that, you know, we see today, the monster that we see today was still fairly young, even when the ICL started, like compared to now, it was somewhere in between 96 and modern day. Yeah. So, so the, the whole TV rights thing is quite interesting because you got to remember that cricket, but not just cricket, pretty much everything that was an American sport mm. in the 80s was still ticket-based culture. You made your money from selling tickets in sport. And so it, if you think it, it might look a little bit backwards that the BCCI didn't realize this. And at, as we just said, Cricket Australia were making money off their TV rights, but Cricket Australia were making a lot more money from having a one day uh, or a test match at the MCG than they were from rights. Mm. Right. Cause you had so, you know, you had 70,000 people coming into a game or 50,000 people coming into a game at the SCG. Um, and so that was, abs that was way different. So, the fact that they weren't just, they didn't just have to unlock the ability to sell it. They were paying money to Dordashen to broadcast cricket for them. And then it's through the 90s that cable TV takes over as well. And that's when it makes it even more so because now you have multiple channels who might want cricket, plus overseas tours started being shown, which meant that. So I think Sky were probably the first major um, cable TV company in cricket. So if England were playing in India, Sky was looking to pay someone money to be able to do this and a good amount of money because they didn't want it, you know, they wanted to make sure that they, they uh, you know, secured this and, and everything else. And, and so there is that whole movement going towards it. So by 2008, the BCCI or 2007, the BCCI is a lot more professional and a lot smarter and moving mm. forward. But they are still, there's a lot of old guys in blazers who don't understand this new world. Uh, you know, they haven't quite, that, that there was, people might remember that before there was sort of India, England and Australia, it was an Asian block mm. um, and a Western block uh, with the two powerhouses within, you know. So India wasn't like on their own or anything. They were clearly mm. the most powerful of the Asian bloc. But if you go back to that 96 World Cup you talk about, do you remember what the organizing committee of that um, 96 World Cup was called? I do not. It was called PILCOM. Hmm. Pakistan, India, Lanka, right? Think about if you were doing that now, the likelihood <laughs> of Pakistan being involved, let alone being the first letter in the acronym, <laughs> yeah. is very, very unlikely, right? Yeah. And so, you know, Pakistan still had a lot of, uh, you know, sway as well, and they were partnered with, it, it's hilarious, mm you know, not, I mean, dreadful for society, mm. but hilarious to think back that India and Pakistan were together on so many different issues within cricket. So that's- Jagmohan, Jagmohan Dalmia was a big fan of that, right? He was the guy who kind of like 
push that forward. That Asian yeah, yeah, he got the three boards together mm. for Pilcom, right? Like, mm. it, you know, it was his, it was his baby, and yeah. um, you know, and obviously, it also matters where the power base of Indian cricket mm. is because that uh, you know he was from Kolkata, mm. and the power base of Indian cricket now is very much you know BJP, and yeah. they have a very different view on Pakistan. Mm. But you know, so you have all this this happening. Obviously, Srinivasan is getting involved around this time as well. Uh, Lalit Modi is more involved uh, with Indian cricket. So they're starting to assemble the sorts of names that could go on to define cricket. But they weren't a really, really well-run cricket organization or a really sharp cricket or- organization in 2007. Remember, they voted against the T20 World Cup, um, mm. the first one. They That's how far behind the times that they were um, at that stage. So you're right. They were, they were sort of halfway between the old India – Hmm. and the new India at that point. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because when Subhash Chandra launched the ICL, T20 cricket hadn't really shot up in India. People didn't believe in it. They thought it was like a gimmick. And Hmm. it wasn't even played domestically, right? So that just goes on to show you where it was. They didn't even uh, send the major team to that that first World Cup, right? They sent a B team. Yeah, in their minds, they were like, we'll just send the youngsters, but they won that inaugural T20 World Cup in 2007. And then it went from being a gimmick to this big cash cow of the future. And it basically prompted the BCCI to lay the foundations for the IPL. Like So mm. they already had the IC- ICL as an existing tournament, which they saw play out. So that definitely helped expedite that entire process, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think the IPL would have happened anyway. Mm. But seeing that the ICL was coming, they had to do something. They were like, let's take the illegitimate brother and amp that brother up. Just, you know, and then, as I said before, Lala Modi has so many cases to answer for and the sorts of things that he got involved with in cricket, uh, you know, not ideal. But from an entrepreneurial point of view, some of the things he did were absolutely genius, like getting IMG to run it. As you would know with the PSL, one of the reasons the PSL was so well run at times was because IMG were involved with it for a long time as well. They knew how to run big events. The ICL was not like that. So mm. being able to point to the ICL and go, look, this thing is already successful and they have no big name players. They don't know what they're doing. It's mm. terribly marketed. It's a mess of a tournament. We've got this thing that they're, they're basically stealing out this idea that we have kicking around here. We've now just won this tournament. And that's the other thing. There was a whole new generation of stars coming through at that point. Obviously, MS Dhoni being the main one of which there were to market. You know the, the, that that older team was. You know that sort of. You still had the legends of Sachin and Viru and and Dravid mm. and Anil Kumble, but you also had the sexiness of Dhoni, and then obviously you know Virat and Rohit would come uh, very very soon after that mm. as well. So there was a few lucky things there, but they set the IPL up very very well from an organisation and structural point of view. Com- compared to the BCCI, which wasn't run anywhere near as well at that time. And what you, you mentioned before is they had all the biggest players and not just yeah. the biggest local players, right? They had the biggest international players as well. And so it went from, you know, I, I'm, they used, remember they always used to call it a domestic league early on, and that's to do with the windows and everything and why they called it that, whatever. But it was essentially an international league from, you know, almost, the, the, you know, you look at the coaches, you look at the commentators, you look at the mm. players. It was a very, very international league from the start. And it, whether it would have come together as quickly as it did without the ICL, I don't know. It might have taken them just a little bit longer to gum around with that just because um, they didn't have that external pressure. But once they had someone about to embarrass them, they, you know, they kicked in very, very fast. Oh, I mean, they flat out refused to acknowledge the ICL, right? The BCCI. And that also meant that the ICC wasn't able to give its blessings to the competition either, which meant that you can't attract top current talent. You're tracking, mm. uh, attack, attracting retired international players. And also, I remember back in the day, it was a big thing in Pakistan because it actually did attract a lot of top players in Pakistan, right? Inzi had retired, so let's not talk about him. But Abdul Razak was still a very, very key player. He went to the ICL. Imran Nazir? Imran Nazir lit the ICL on fire. Remember they used yep. to give those scooters when you won a game? Imran Nazir probably has like 10 scooters at his place, right? Uh, Rana Navidul Hassan was also a really successful yep. player in the ICL. Also uh, someone who was playing for Pakistan at that point. So that was a big thing. Mohammad Yusuf. I remember they roped him in, in as well after that uh, calendar uh, or record record breaking uh, calendar year in cricket. 
right? After 2006, they got Yusuf as well. So it was quite chaotic in that regard. And a lot of those but, bands got overturned later as well. But I remember chaos when this stuff was happening. Well, but also like, you know, within the, in the main feature, we didn't get into all these details, but there's mm. really fascinating of what happened directly in the ICL, which is mm. they have a franchise league, which I and I think this is because they didn't come up with it, right? But it kind of works. But then they're like, oh, what are we going to do for the next nine or 10 months? Because there was no other franchise cricket. There was nothing else going on. And so then they had like an international tournament at one stage. So there was Pakistani teams, world teams, Indian teams, and Bangladesh teams. But there was also already the Lahore Badshahs and yeah. the Bangladesh team. So it didn't really make sense to do that. So they kind of bastardized their <laughs> franchise model with international model at the same yeah. time. And also you had a tournament, then about six months later you had a tournament, then about five months later you had mm. a tournament. Right? Then, then they were planning a 50-over tournament as well. Yeah. That's what I mean. If you go back and you look at the IPL in comparison, the IPL was like, we know what our product is. Hmm. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to organize it. This is why it's going to work. 10 months, we can wait 10 months. They had the Champions League, so it was a little bit better in those days. Hmm. But we can wait the 10 months. This is going to work, and this is how it's going to go. I don't think the uh, Subhash Chandra and or ZTV or whoever was running it ever truly believed in the ICL, hmm. but – they were getting people to the grounds and they yeah. were getting uh, people watching on TV. Uh, and so it was in some ways working, but it just, without the main, without the main Indian players, forget the international players, mm. without the main Indian players, it just, it couldn't work. And we've seen that with the Big Bash, right? Like imagine yeah. right now, if at the um, if the Big Bash was being played the same way it was, and then three months later you had another tournament that had David Warner and uh, Pat mm. Cummins and Josh Hazelwood, and well, which one are people going to watch? Right? Uh, you know, are they, are they going to then then are they going to watch Duncan Thornley come out of retirement, <laughs> or are they going to go and watch Pat Cummins? Right? Like, it, mm. and that was it, there were just too many flaws within that system, and it was mm. just too messy. A lot of people complain that I'm not a former cricketer and so that I don't really know the game. Well, you know what they can't claim? That I don't know desks. I've been using desks for years. I'm a collector of desks, old and new, and I'm sitting on a new one right now. I'm the Don Bradman of sitting at desks. So when I tell you that the E7 Pro next generation height adjustable desk from FlexiSpot is legit. This is like Michael Jordan talking to you about sneakers. This desk holds 160 kilograms. It is as stable as anything I've ever seen, and it has under-desk cable management. But really, the main skill here is that this desk rises and falls at the push of a button, and it moves super quick. And it has so many settings that remember your favorite heights. It really does it all. And I could not recommend the E7 Pro from FlexiSpot anymore, even though I am currently sitting on one of FlexiSpot's BS12 Pro multifunctional, adjustable, upgraded fabric ergonomic chairs. My butt and computer have never been happier than when using one of FlexiSpot's products. So get over to their page right now for big savings. Yeah, I mean, there are a fair few things you said over there. Of course, one was that the ICL did not have structure. It was a bunch of random tournaments and bastardized is a great term. I'm going to use that. That's what they did with that, right? There were like international teams playing it. There were like multiple T20 championships. Mm. Then in the end, it was like a World Series sort of format. So that didn't help at all. Also. We have to definitely factor in how, you know, top international cricketers were already making money in this era as opposed to the Kerry Packer era. So they are yes. harder to draw and, and pull uh, towards the tournament, even though like that's probably why they attracted top Pakistan talent because they're grossly underpaid, right? Like they didn't make a lot of money. And then, of course, I think the biggest thing that you mentioned over here and the most valid one is that they did not have the top tier of Indian players playing over there. Like, sure, Ambati Rayudu comes to mind who made a name for himself in the ICL and then, you know, won five IPLs as well. Other names are Stuart Binney. I remember he was pretty good at the ICL. Mm. Uh, there was this one cricketer called Raja Gopal Satish. Love that guy. I don't know I where do he is. I remember him at all. Now. Uh, someone, if you... Uh, Watching this, leave like a Rajagopal Satish video in the comments if you can find it. He was like uh, explosive. But you know, without all of those big ticket Indian names, that will ultimately lead to a lack of interest and sponsorship deals, you know, not being as lucrative as they can be. Forget the crowds. You can get crowds in India to watch any sort of cricket. But without mm. those big Indian players, it's just, it was handicapped from the get-go, this league. Yeah, it was 
I mean, there's so many things that brought it down when mm. you think about it. So one is, as I said, I don't think they believed in the product all that much. Mm. Like, as I, I've said before, Lalit Modi, many dodgy things um, mm. that, that he was involved with, but he completely believed in what he was putting out, right? Mm. And clearly they didn't. Then you've got, as you said, you don't have the major Indian players. Mm. And Stuart Binney wasn't famous at that stage. Ranu mm. was a little bit known, but again, you're not going to a stadium to watch him play, you know, uh, as as a draw card. Um, there was and a then- Thiru Kumaran. Venu Gopal Rao, man, I remember a lot about. This I, remember, I remember, I <laughs> remember um, uh, Gopal Rao, but yeah. but you also international players. You had Chris Harris, and hmm. you know, I love Chris Harris, but again, you you know, you're not to see a 43 year old Chris Harris. You're probably not gonna you know pay all that. He probably wasn't 43, but he always looks 43. You but, had Lara, uh, Damien Martin. Yeah, there was a couple of good inside, hmm. but again, they were past their best. They yep. you know, so so you've got the so you've got the the organizers don't really believe in the concept. The ma- the international players are names, but old, and the current the ones are better pl- paid. So yeah. it's hard to sway them. Yeah, the the, the local players are not a a tier, right? Mm. And then the BCCI shut shut it down as quickly as possible. So yeah, bans to players, bans to coaches, bans to administrators. Bans to service uh, providers as well. I was going right? to say, but that's the really important one is they go after the sponsors and the service mm. providers. Yes. And, and, and so, so you know, generally in cricket, the way that it works in sponsorship. So you'll see I had a HCL as my sponsor, right? Mm. And HCL also sponsored the Australian cricket team, right? So quite often you'll get – someone will put money in. So I think Jaguar – was it Jaguar? Um, sponsored the English cricket team and then they sponsored Crick Info at the same time. Mm. You, you know, and you see this, Investec did a similar thing, right? And you see it in Australia and India and all these different places because they're going to put their money in cricket. So there aren't that many advertisers that are going to put their money in cricket, but generally you will have someone who will advertise with uh, the TV company and the team at the same time. We're going to own cricket. So that you, when you think about cricket, you'll think about our product or our brand or whatever it may be. So when you start to go after them, you're now in a, in a much bigger uh, problem. The other thing was that it was before streaming and mm. uh, social media and all that sort of stuff. Like I think Twitter was, ju- was existed, but certainly wasn't big in India. Facebook, what was the one that was big in India? Or- Orchid? Orchid, or Orchid. Yeah. It was big in right? Pakistan as well. <laughs> yeah, Pakistan, Brazil, and India were the three mm. places that used Orchid. I don't know why I know these facts, but this, this <laughs> is all true. Um, but that wasn't a really well-run social media platform and it, you know it was you know no one no one who had a business at that stage was like oh we're big on orchid like no <laughs> one gave a shit right you know you wouldn't even say you were big on facebook in those days it didn't make mm. any sense so they didn't have other ways of monetizing or getting you know brand uh, opportunity they didn't believe as i said they didn't have the stars local or domestic uh they didn't have the draw into the grounds uh and so you and you didn't have the advertisers you didn't have the best tv producers you know, uh, they lost Capital Dev. Like, you know, all these different people who were involved were already slipping away. So it Just really on was. That, on Kapil, I remember this was a major, you know, story back in the day that, of course, they had Kapil Dev as the face of the ICL and he was kind of the one who was front and center. Of course, mm-hmm. there were other people as well, but there was a lot of bad blood between Kapil Dev and the BCI. They, they removed him as the chairman of the NCA and this is Kapil Dev we're talking about. At that point, he is the only cricketer who has won them an ODI World Cup captain, sorry, right? And they've even gone to war with Kapil. Sure, he got reinstated later and they made up, but that's just how serious they were. This meant war. <laughs> he probably, and, and, and one of the reasons he was probably furious is he probably made more money from the ICL than he ever did from Indian cricket. Mm-hmm. Might be different now, you know, um, that there's so much money in Indian cricket and he appears yeah. in things and does TV. But up until 2008, it would not have shocked me if the ICL in one contract paid him more <laughs> than he'd ever made before, right? And and you're right, like people were black, uh, black, black band and, and barred and, uh, you know, I, I know as much as friends not talking to each other because mm. it was like, I can't talk to you because you're with that other league. Um, mm. It really, really was a sticky, dirty kind of situation. But that's what these, you know, you're talking about, you know, what, what's the best way of putting it? Like industrial sabotage is what mm. was happening, right? Yeah. Um, 
which is hilarious because we never really have an industry in cricket before this moment either. <laughs> Suddenly you have it. Um, but yeah, I think all those different things brought it down. That, but but essentially, it was a the IPL was your top tier, your your Cartier, right? Mm. And the ICL was um, when you when you're at a service station and you see someone selling jewelry. Like it was that different, the quality of 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 the of the jewelry in this kind of situation. It really was so stark. Like it, I think if we looked at if we looked at the ICL now, like the quality of cricket was absolutely fucking terrible. <laughs> it was so bad that like I'm sure the major league cricket right now is stronger in their first year than the ICL was, um, and you know. Uh, some of those, you know, the Hong Kong blitz probably wasn't that far off where mm. the ICL was, right? It, there was some really, really bad cricket played in that tournament as well, yeah. which didn't help. There was just too many things against it. Yeah. Plus the BCCI at one point, you know, they just welcomed back to all the ICL players and they were like, okay, you know, we're lift, lifting your bands. You can come and compete in the IPL. Uh, and wanna, that, wanna, yeah, you know, that is really interesting. And I want to bring mm. this up because it's it's really fascinating. Do you, do you remember Test Match so far? I don't. So Test Match so far, do you know what Gorilla Cricket is? Yes. Gorilla Cricket is the um, phase two of Test Match so far. Hmm. So Test Match so far started as a Gorilla Cricket broadcast, which is why they use Gorilla Cricket as their name. They didn't pay for rights. They commentated on the games um, and they got a massive fan base, right? Do you know what brought down Test Match so far? It wasn't ECB sanctions. It wasn't uh, potential lawsuits. It wasn't even going after their sponsors. Eventually, the way that they brought Test Match Sofa down was BBC hired Daniel Norcross, who had set mm. up Test Match Sofa, right? That is essentially what you have to do. You have to take the main talent from the other person. And you, you look at all these companies around the world, you know, these big companies, they will do a very similar thing. They'll see an upstart coming up and they'll buy that company. Uh, and that young entrepreneur is like so excited to get a $20 million paycheck. Mm. And then they work out that they're now in some office without windows um, in Silicon Valley and they don't get to work on their product anymore. And their product is never, it's not even going to be part of the, the future, but they've stopped that other company um, mm. coming up. And that's essentially what the BCCI did. They said, oh, no, no, you guys can come back. <laughs> And that, that, you know, there wasn't that much talent in that league to begin with, as we just talked about. And they just... Yeah. Financially make it feasible or make it make sense for those people and just enhance your product. But it did get kind of ugly with all the blacklisting and shadow banning of service providers, right? I mean, there's, a, you know, Lalit Modi, the father of the IPL, is on record to make such, so, uh, such of a sort of an allegation, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You wrote about it in your piece as well. Tell us a little bit about that. What was yeah, the I mean, they, what, they basically what he was saying is they went after everyone who was working in cricket hmm. because a lot of people were trying to double dip and they were going to work for the IPL or the BCCI and the ICL. Hmm. And again, this this was you know an industry war, right? And hmm. so, oh, well, if you work for cricket, if you do freelance for Crick Info, you can't go and do freelance for Crick Buzz very often. Right. Yeah. If you, if you do freelance for BBC, they don't go let you go and do freelance for Talk Sport. There's a lot of companies that have this. I disagree with this nonsense, mm. but there are a lot of major companies that think that way. Like and and that's what was happening with the BCCI and the IPL at that stage. They were saying to these people, "You can't work for both. Mm. You need to make a choice." And when when it comes to one of the things they did was, as you said, the service providers. There aren't that many people in the world who produce cricket at a very high level, mm. right? And so if you take those people away, there's probably like seven or eight top level cricket directors at, in the world at the moment. And I don't think there would have been as many back in 2008. Um, yeah. And there's a few others now that, that now are very good at it because there's so much franchise cricket. So there's maybe now another 20 or 30 who are really fantastic at that level mm. below. Back in those days, there weren't that many. You know, Channel Nine, Channel Nine had a few, and and Sky had a few. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if uh, Tony Cozier's son uh, w was involved at that stage. Um, uh, there's also an English cricket writer whose son uh, is 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 another one. But there weren't that many of those sorts of top level talent around at that point. So again, they went after the weakness, which was mm. uh, you're gonna you struggle to do this, and that inc that it would have included sponsors, and it would have included, mm. you know. Oh, there wouldn't have been social media people back in those days, but 
it might have been someone who does marketing, mm. right? If you do marketing for cricket, you might have been told you can't do that anymore. If you're an agent, player agent, we want, might not sign your players for the IPL if they're, if you've got other players in the ICL. That's yeah. that's that's where it got. And you can say it's murky, but it's also murky to have a Rebel League and to buy all these players on the side. Like, no, there's no good guy in that situation. Like, yeah. everyone's... And everyone was being selfish and they were doing it for their own reasons. And that's mm. kind of where those sorts of things come from. So, it, it, you know, on, on in every single way, that's how they go. I mean, it is weird that Cricket Australia and cricket and New Zealand Cricket and uh, CSA and Irish Cricket, all, cricket Island, all these places, why are they the only ones who are allowed to say what major cricket games are played in the country? Mm-hmm. Like it is, if you think about it, it's a very, very like who voted them in, right? Who who decided that uh, Cricket Australia could run cricket? <laughs> um, so I, I, when you think about it from that point of view, and I've heard people in cricket say this before, then it gets a little bit more murky. What 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 what? So Z, so another billionaire can't run cricket, but um, your your men in blazers are allowed to. It, yeah. it, so it, it is, it's a, it's a weird situation to begin with, I suppose, is the way of putting it. It's all arbitrary, I suppose, when you look at it from that lens. But also, neither of those two Rebel Leagues, both the World Series Cricket or the ICL, were born out of the love for the game. Both of those billionaires wanted to make more money, right? And I suppose what the IPL did was it didn't go for the head of the snake when it was dealing with the ICL. It just cut off. The imaginary limbs. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have used snake. <laughs> Once you over went here. snake, I yeah. could see that you were going to struggle there. Yeah, no, no, you're right. No, no. You're yeah, Godzilla. Right. Yeah. They, w- they didn't go for Godzilla's head. They cut off his limbs and tail, right? So yeah, that you're talking he just couldn't, couldn't survive, right? Uh, but one of the other major issues with the ICL, Jared, was that there was a lack of transparency when it came to its finances, right? And uh, fixing rumors were rampant. And uh, New Zealand batter Lou Vincent even went on, you know, later to admit that he started fixing games of cricket during the ICL. And now, you know, granted that the IPL also went through something similar. The ICL in comparison was, you know, more pronounced when it came to fixing. And uh, yeah, it it was quite apparent at times as well. I, I Of all the cricket I've ever watched, and I've seen some pretty corrupt leagues, there's nothing I've ever seen compared to the ICL. Hmm. I remember watching a game, I reckon it was the first season, where one bowler was, I think, intentionally trying to bowl wide down the leg side, and a batter was trying to stop the balls from being called wide, (laughs) because the cricket did not make any sense for about a minute and a half. And I was just watching it going, are we, like, obviously, clearly two (laughs) conflicting fixes happening at the same time. Players walking past balls to get stumped and missing the ball by like a meter. Mm. Um, runouts that just looked sus. Fumbles there where it's just like, you know, and it looked really, really bad. That What I was told from players involved was that it got so bad that Tony Gregg went. I don't know if he went into all the players or if it was just one team, but went into one team. Uh, it was, sorry, went into a bunch of players and just went, will you guys stop fixing so blatantly? <laughs> right and and that's what it was like and um watching it do, do you you would have watched a little bit of it you probably would have watched the second season when Lahore came I in. watched all of it you watched the first <laughs> season too I did not miss the ICL I was oh, in love with the ICL I loved you it you would have been quite young so you might not have picked up all the subtleties obviously but you know uh, in Pakistan everyone is uh, kind of always looking out for fixing because we have PTSD and I remember that when we used to be watching that tournament, everyone would say, that, oh, this is just too apparently fixed. And, you know, you couldn't even not believe it because then later on all of those things surfaced. And at that point, 99 was not as far as it is right now, you know? No. It, look, it, I think the ICL was the second big boom in fixing. And I mm. do think it brought about what follows afterwards, you know, mm. with with the IPL, with Pakistan, mm. um, uh, you know, with dom- English domestic cricket and everything yeah. else. I really do think um, those three, I'm not saying it wouldn't have happened anyway, because mm. I do know at the 2007 World Cup that there was a lot of rumours that mm. um, Salman Butt was already involved. And so maybe that had started, but 
watching the ICL, it just, that was, as I said, that was at the point where you just like, well, this doesn't make any sense what we are watching mm. here at the moment. Maybe that's why a lot of those cricketers from that time compared T20 cricket to the WWF or WWE because clearly this was happening and everyone must have been aware of it. And the ICL, let's just say, was more blatant than any other league that we've probably witnessed, right? Yeah, there is some dodgy blatant stuff is the happening. Best word. There is some dodgy stuff happening in some T10 leagues, however, but uh, that... Even, be- even, look, <laughs> to be honest, you know, there's there's some major T20 leagues that I still have mm. huge um, question marks over I, mm. as, as we see them at the moment. But nothing, nothing like I've ever seen in the ICL. That was, it, it yeah. really did look like, uh, it looked like a comedy movie where mm. like both teams have been paid to fix it at the same time. It was like two <laughs> boxes hitting each other at the same time and both falling over. Yeah. And I mean, unfortunately, it does still maintain that reputation. You mentioned how Tony Gregg stormed into one of those uh, change rooms or whatever. Now, he's an interesting case study over here. Uh, as we know, he was involved in World Series cricket and he was one of uh, Kerry Packer's main men. He was told by Kerry Packer that you'd always have a job at Channel 9 and he was used for recruiting players as well. And in the ICL, he was involved as a board member and was also doing commentary, right? This is a guy who was born in South Africa and couldn't play for his country because everyone had stopped playing his country. Then he moved to England before the word Cole Pack existed, went on to Captain England. And he also played in the second ever ODI at a time where ODIs were laughed upon. So... Mm. He is the ultimate rebel cricketer. <laughs> it's incredible. I, I don't think I'd ever really put it together and, until I was doing this. And so Estelle, Estelle and I co-wrote this article and she mentioned Tony Gregg in it. And I started thinking about him and I went, wait a minute. Tony Gregg was involved in Kerry Packer and he was also involved in the ICL. So he's the most rebellious cricketer. And then you think, <laughs> wait a minute, he was a South African who captained England as well. Um, and you start to put all these things together and he really was at the, at the forefront of almost every major schism or faction or moment in cricket, uh, all the way through. Right. Uh, he also uh, made you know, the, we'll make them grovel comment just to that's spice what, but it even, up. <laughs> but even something like that was comments like that had been said before, right? Mm. Like not, not, I mean, they, his was really bad, but, but I mean, comments like that have been said before. That's almost the first sort of TV faux pas of a captain. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like you can just go through the, all the different things and, and Tony Gregg has become sort of, you either love him or hate him as a, as a commentator. Um, and that's how he's remembered. But he's so much more than that to cricket mm. because World Series cricket would not have been as successful without him. The ICL, I, th- I mean, you say he was a board member, and he was. He was the czar of that league. I remember mm. uh, talking to Dean Jones about it once and because and, Dean Jones was on that board. Dean Jones yeah. was there, right, and, and wanted to make it successful. Tony Gregg was the driving force of that. So that's the dr- he was the driving force behind two different Rebel Leagues. Um, and one of the most famous commentators we've ever had, a great player as well, Mm. as you said, involved in, it's just remarkable how many times Tony Gregg was involved in all those sorts of things. And if you think back to it, it goes back to the fact he was a freelance cricketer, Mm. right? He had to look at cricket differently because if he'd looked at cricket the same as everyone else, he would never have had a career. He wouldn't have been able to go and play, um, anywhere else. He had to think about things very, very differently. Um, and, and I suppose, you know, you look at Chandra and you look at Packer and you look at Greg. These are all men just doing things that they needed to, you know, for their own personal gains, right? But through those three people, they've made a massive impact on our game. Um, and, you know, I would say that they are the, they are the forefront of the capitalist movement coming in and change. You know, we're doing a podcast now and in 10 years' time, we have no idea what cricket is going to be like, right? Yeah. And that was not the case in 1995, right? Mm-hmm. And that was not the case in, in 1920. And, these, you know, we have just gone through so many revolutions and these three people have a huge role to part, play in it, despite the fact that Kerry Packer has passed away, Tony Gregg has passed away. Is, I don't know if Chandra, is Chandra still with us? I think he is, isn't he? Not, not uh, sure. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and yet the, these impacts they made, and you, you pointed out before, all these people love cricket. All three that we just mentioned just now. Absolutely love cricket. I've had conversations with Tony Gregg about cricket. Uh, Me and him disagree on many different things, but he absolutely loved cricket. Kerry Packer certainly loved cricket. 
uh, Subhash Chandra also love cricket. But they impacted the game, not because they love cricket, but for other personal reasons that they were yeah. involved in. And it's a fascinating thing. And you could, Lala Modi, you could throw in there as well if you mm. want, because he's the fourth one of, of, of that list, right? Of, yeah. again, these guys had their own agendas and did their own things, but by being who they were, um, played a big part. And if you want to go back to Abe, um, was Abe Bailey, the South African who formed the ICC, we've, we've had a lot of people who've changed the game massively because of, you know, uh, the way that they, uh, because of a personal belief or because of mm. something they wanted for their own business or just to put money in their pocket or power in their pocket. Yeah. Uh, you spoke of impact, of course, and how big of an impact all three of those guys have had. And, you know, you can credit a lot of, um, you know, the success of the IPL model to something that already existed in the ICL. But just in general, you know, if you look at the Indian market and landscape, the ICL provided a base for what a successful franchise league represents, not just in cricket. Yes, of course, the IPL picked up the good parts from it and just made them better. But, you know, uh, they provided the funny names, third empires reviewing each ball. And mm. also just they made franchise sport uh, mainstream in a way in India. Like now you look at so many sports in India being run under the franchise model. Even soccer, football is run under the franchise model in India, whereas everywhere else in the world it isn't. So uh, when it comes to like impacting the nation at large and the way sport is run in India, the ICL's impact is massive. Maybe massive isn't even the right adjective over here, you know? It, it, it's incredible because it's not... Uh, I, so today, I, was, I had to look up something. This was completely separate to this podcast, mm. but I had to look up something at, from the ICL. And when I looked it up, it's so hard to Google it. Mm. It doesn't come up, right? And you watched it. Yes. And you were in Pakistan or Canada at the time? Pakistan. I was in Australia. So you're in Pakistan, I'm in Australia, we're both watching this tournament, right? Hmm. We've just talked about the impact that it had. Franchise sports, Kabaddi Premier League, hmm. right? Like, you know, things like that. Uh, the, fr the fact that even when the ICL started, before the IPL was successful, cricket boards were already like, oh, oh, this is a thing. Hmm. The team names. We never had team yes. names. We had, the baggy, we had baggy greens and the black caps and the spring box, and they were all authentic names. They weren't like forced on by marketing departments <laughs> or anything, right? You know, uh, uh, is it Springboks? Have I got that yes. right? Or Springboks yeah. or rugby team? I always get confused. It is, it, it is the rugby team is Springboks and the Proteas are the cricket team. Proteas, sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. The minute I said it, I was like, they're not the Springboks. Mm. There is, I know there's a team called the Spring. But the point <laughs> is, a lot of those team names kind of happened, you know, naturally or, you know, evolved mm. naturally, especially the, the two the, involving the Caps and, this was all completely different, right? Mm. There was Amer there was an American element of it, and I think the American element is really, really important. But the Indian element of it, right? The you go back, I would say that the ICL was more Indian than even the IPL was. Mm. It felt like a completely Indian product for Indian people. And yet through that, it really did impact so many different parts of cricket and yet was a massive failure, I suppose you would say now, <laughs> in that it didn't last that long and kind yeah. of just fizzled out. And, and I'm sure there are tons of people in cricket who were never paid. for. I mean, at that point the where ICL. they just had uh, rebel international teams competing against each other, they'd completely lost the plot by then. I, I mean, that that is... Uh, th the funniest thing about it is... If the IPL wasn't about to come, would anyone have tried franchise cricket again in 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 that period, right? Because mm. the IPL was already in motion. You couldn't stop that. But by the ICL started as a franchise league and ended as a really, really crap seniors um, uh, uh, um, uh, B team type, <laughs> type of league. I wonder now if the IPL hadn't have been coming like a freight train, whether we would even be in a situation that we're in now or mm. whether anyone else would have done it as well. And does the IPL also owe the ICL a, a help for saying, look, it is going to work. You guys have to invest in it, but do it properly. Don't do it like us because this is madness. <laughs> well, I suppose on the closing note, of course, this is a tournament that both you and I have followed closely, weirdly enough. And I was an early teen, so I actually have very vivid memories of this tournament, even the weird 
jerseys this, that this tournament gave us. They were really ugly looking, by the way. Uh, but, they were horrendous. Yeah. Uh, but isn't it a little unfortunate and sad that, you know, Gen Z kids, they won't be able to educate themselves about the ICL as much unless they watch this podcast. But it is, <laughs> you know, kept in the dark. You mentioned how you can't really look for anything online on the ICL. You searched the ICL on Google and you got the IPL, right? So the yep. data from the ICL is lost to the sands of time. And I do find that a little unfortunate because, you know, it is a part of my life which I can never recount via scorecards anymore. And and my kids will never know about it. Yeah. Do you know what? I don't, I don't know how much you know about this, but the Kerry Packer League, so those stats aren't considered official stats either. Mm. Right. And yet, Greg Chappell and Viv Richards. So, so Greg Chappell has a huge hole in the middle of his international career where he, he might be one of the greatest batters we've ever had. And mm. for three years or whatever it was, we we don't have his numbers. And it took me forever to find really accurate scorecards and and stats from World Series cricket. And they're still not considered even first-class level, mm. right? And so that's still important. And Buddy Radu's ICL stats and... Imran Nazir's ICL mm. stats, I think, are still important and are still part of the story of cricket. But we don't really, we are not, we're good at stories in cricket, right? But we're not always good at just jotting down the important things as they are happening, mm. right? And and I do think too often this kind of things happen. Look, I'm not, I'm not sad that people can't, find the scorecards really easily or find the names of the... How many teams do you reckon you could name, by the way? So we've Hedra, said... Hyderabad Heroes, yep. Lahore Badshahs, Chandigarh Lions. Oh, um, I forgot that one. Delhi Jets, Delhi Giants, something like that. Gi- Giants, yes. Yeah, Delhi Giants. I can't remember Mumbai's name. Um, there was a Mumbai Chennai was team. the champs, but I didn't remember that till I went back. I remember mm. Chennai Superstars. Ooh. Yes, you're right. And and I couldn't remember the Bangladesh name. And there's Dhaka, the Ahmedabad. Dhaka. Warriors. Warriors, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, there was the um, uh, Ahmedabad Rockets and the Royal Bengal Tigers, which was a fan. <laughs> I, actually, I kind of like hey, that one. They completely ripped off those names. Royal Bengal Tigers, uh, Chennai Superstars. Hello. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I do think, you know... It's just one of those things that should be remembered because mm. it has played a big part in our cricket history. And it would be, you know, it, whether it be not enough of us even remember why the ICC was formed, right? And it that completely changed cricket's path forever because if the ICC had been formed out of love for the game ra- rather than for political reasons to make South Africa more relevant and <laughs> um, keep America and Ireland and whoever else wanted to come in out of it, Um our game would be completely different. And the ICL, again, laid the path for what modern cricket is, for better or for worse, right? It Mm. laid the path for players to get paid a lot more money and for international cricket to probably die, which is even more (laughs) hilarious when you go back on it and you remember that they actually went back to international cricket at the end. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, and uh, speaking of, you know, lost numbers, uh, Imran Nazir might have been able to get better agent or better gigs if those numbers were available because he was like absolutely fan-fucking-tastic in that he, tournament. It was, it, I mean, it is he was so brilliant in that yeah. tournament where I was even like, because I remember that by that stage going, this is terrible cricket. And I was still like, this guy's great. Like, we yeah. need to get more Imran Nazir out. He is completely different to everyone else. Yeah, I just wish he was born 10 years later or something. But anyway, uh, whoever watched the ICL knows exactly what we're talking about. Anyway, That wraps up this podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, give this video a like and subscribe to both this channel and Jared's other channel on YouTube. And also, we have all of our work, the pieces, the videos, the podcasts in a one-stop shop website called goodareas.co. So go and bookmark goodareas.co and we'll be back next week with another episode of Footmarks. That's all for now. Goodbye.